I want to give a little background for uh, the inspiration for uh, this talk, which, so, you know, with the last few years, with um, my inability to leave Australia, and even then with lots of conferences being online, and just the time zone differences, I couldn't actually even see some of these talks. So I didn't actually see Frank Kyle's talk at CD, uh, at I think CDS on um, this notion that concepts become whether or not concepts sort of go from concrete to abstract. It's like there's a long standing idea that concrete that concepts start out of concrete, get more abstract. For the times when I didn't actually see the talk, but I saw people on Twitter talking about it, I'm sure that was just as good in terms of understanding all the nuances that he, you know, made. But I, after seeing that conversation, I then got in touch with uh, Karen Walker and said, hey, this is an interesting idea. We kind of think about, we think about these things. Let's maybe have a symposium. Anyway, that didn't quite come together yet. But then Karen gave a talk in July, I think, that was sort of kind of like a longer version of what I kind of imagined uh, her doing in the symposium. And then now, so, so just imagine that you've just watched that talk. All right. And so now, <laughs> so now this is like a symposium. Now I pretend this is kind of like the longer version of uh, the symposium talk. Uh, anyway, so not, I'm sure everyone has perfect memory of that. <laughs> so, all right. So um, now perhaps this was my own faulty assumption, but or probably around 2010, I was certainly at least tacitly assuming that you know, kids younger than four couldn't really do very much impressive relational cognition, right? And um, you know, and I'm just going to assume that everyone here already cares about relational cognition. I'm not going to say why relational cognition matters, right? So, um, you know, and I'm not. I'm also going to ignore language learning. Uh, let's just pretend that doesn't exist. What I'm saying, um, you know, under, younger kids don't seem to be that great at this. However. Uh, since in the you know in the years since then there's been lots of very you know sort of novel and perhaps if especially if you had that assumption surprising demonstrations of just how good uh, much younger people actually are uh, at doing uh, things like relational abstraction and generalizing across uh, sets of objects that share relations. So um, work with uh, six month old and three month old infants. Uh, uh, Ferry et al, Anderson et al, and Karen's work first, I think in the 2014 paper and up uh, since then with, um, you know, the most recent uh, paper, I think in this line sort of showing that not only can kids, um, you know, learn uh, uh, causal relationships based on that are related to sort of the abstract notion of same and different, but they can sort of hold that idea in mind at the same time as a more uh, sort of simpler object-based hypothesis about causal relationships, all right? So, you know, so, so I think, you know, all this work from multiple labs, yeah, I think is all great, extremely interesting. Um, now, at the same time, there was sort of some other work with adults that on uh, hierarchical Bayesian uh, models of causal learning in the base, and I'm not gonna go into the details of how these work and, and I apologize if the detail, if going into the details would actually undermine uh, uh, my conception of them. But the basic notion, I, if I understand it correctly, is that if you're getting individual events um, and you're sort of learning about cause, you're making causal inferences, you're sort of at the same time, you're making causal inferences at multiple levels of, of abstraction. So let's say, for example, you're learning about an individual uh, vaccine and how it uh, uh, prevents, you know, how inoculates you against a sickness. You might at the same time be learning about that and then learning about how, okay, well, also vaccines in general are a type of causal thing that like prevent things from happening, right? And oh, and but antibiotics are a kind of thing, are like the kind of thing that treats things after they happen, right? And you go, oh, and that sort of seems to matter what type of pathogen you have. And then you go, okay, at another level of abstraction, in this kind of health and medicine world, there are some things that treat things and some things that prevent things. And then as a domain, that's, a, and then you might be another domain that you can see has the same structure, which is, oh, this other domain has some things that sort of, you know, acts on things after they happen versus prevents things before they happen. And I think the basic idea is that all these sort of different levels are kind of simultaneously, when you're, you know, if you're getting sort of simple of, of causal events, you are sort of building these hierarchical structures uh, at once. 
right? And this paper, for example, has some, you know, with some pretty, has some pretty cool demonstrations that people appear to be doing this even when they're, when the causal events are pretty simple. All right. So now all the work that I'm going to sort of present that in a way, it, none of it was mo of my work or other people's was, I don't think was motivated against this view. I, I'm just more thinking, okay, this is an interesting theory, theoretical view. I've been doing this other work. Are they incompatible? Right. So I'll sort of, you know, so is this other work actually incompatible with the view, even though it wasn't like it was designed to say, here's what this theory predicts and here's this other theory. All right. All right. So what I, as far as I can, the thing that I feel like this per, perhaps perspective is missing, and, I, and this is even something I even changed a little bit on since I wrote the abstract, uh, is this sort of idea that using relational concepts and recognizing relational patterns in novel situations is like a cognitive skill that takes like effort and has to be like practiced, right? And so, you know, and so for example, if you, you know, and, and that type of idea, I guess, seems obvious if you're thinking about the relational patterns of chess, right? But I think this sort of perhaps generalizes beyond these sort of, you know, made up games that we've developed to, to, to engage these abilities. Right, so other kinds of, right, so other kinds of examples here where the, where like the, where, okay, so, so what's the idea? The idea is that we get, we have to sort of infer our high level relationships from our perceptual input in some kind. And I, and we, and I, what I think is potentially an effortful process is the construction of the, um, uh, is the construction of the relational representations from the input, All right? And so Kelman and Massey have this example on the left where you basically, if you have the example on the left, which uses variables that aren't, that you don't typically use when solving, when doing algebra, it suddenly becomes much harder for people to understand the type of algebraic uh, operations as when you're using X and Y, which we're much more familiar with, th with using, All right? But the ideas that are using of these abstract relationships are actually tied to particular perceptual inputs that we tend to construct them out of. Um, another example, so uh, Andrew uh, Lovett's model of Raven's matrices uh, performance, that what makes it, so right here again, we're sort of constructing, we have, we have to, you know, the effort, what's hard about these problems is like constructing the right representations of them from these kind of confusing visual images. And what the what the Lovin and Forbes simulations sort of argue is that the hardest Ravens problems aren't necessarily because of kind of the complexity of the rule, but because we've misparsed the problem. Where you look at the problem, you kind of get an initial parsing of the objects into their components and the relationships among them. But then you want, at one point have to realize, oh, I've misperceived the problem, and I have to redo my representation. And that's the kind of effort that what makes the most problems the most difficult. All right. All right. So that's a sort of at. Um, all right. So I'm going to go back into development and talk about this type of idea from the beginning of, of life. So in the Fairy et al. Anderson et al. work, right? So they want to sort of show that uh, object experience of the sort of wrong kind can prevent relational generalization. But I thought what was a particularly uh, uh, what finding from the Anderson et al. The social relational abstraction at three months old. However, they only successfully do the relational abstraction when there's two pairs of objects during habituation and not when there's six different pairs of objects during habituation. And that reminded me a lot of this much older work um, from Les Cohen uh, on, on the perception of causal relations and events during infancy. I don't know if people have looked at this work in, in 20 years or what, or 30 years actually, or whether there's modern updates that, I, that I've missed. But if you remember, it was, you know, remember everyone sort of has seen, I imagine these Machat events, right? Where that first one is not seen as causal because there's a little delay when the two uh, balls smack into each other. And then the second one is seen as causal because it smacks into it. And then the other one is launched immediately. All right, and so there was a bunch of work from 1984 and then later on whether or not infants perceive these uh, events as, as causal, or not, do they infer this sort of causal force relationship 
between the sort of just the motion of the objects, right? And Leslie in 1984, um, sort of, are, and the way they sort of de cleverly developed a way, well, how can we tell if inference are doing this, right? Was they did is that whether or, not, whether or not they generalize based on the causal status, sort of they generalize between events that are different from each other on the surface, but share the fact that they're either both causal or both non-causal. So those are actually only one type of causal. So it's really about, do they generalize between different kinds of non-causal events because they're all just non-causal and so they're, they're all the same under that perception. And Leslie sort of showed that with these very simple objects, six months old di did appear to be generalizing across different kinds of non-causal events. Then in 1990, Oakes and Cohen showed that six, when you made the objects more complicated, uh, the six month olds were no longer doing that, but the 10 month olds were. So the 10 month olds were generalizing based on the causal status of the events. And then in Cohen Oakes 1993, but it, um, it wasn't just that they were more complicated objects, but the complicated objects changed every trial and that appeared to overwhelm them with like oh too much object variety and that overwhelming prevented them from recognizing the cause and effect uh relationships all right and so that was the part that was to me reminiscent of the oh yeah i just said all that that was the part to me that was reminiscent of the anderson at all because um you know that is when in both cases there is this variety of objects that is sort of preventing them from rep from sort of constructing the the relational representation from the input. Because if the relational generalization, let's say you had a world where you had this relational representation in mind, and then you had to figure out whether or not you should generalize it, you have to learn the extension of this gen relational generalization. Um, so part of it was just the idea is that more variety should lead to greater generalization. Right. If you if, if it's a perfectly constructed representation, you should be able to generalize further of more variety. However, more variety is overwhelming in preventing them from constructing this relational representation. I'm sure Sue probably has not thought that people would think her work was like Les Cohen's. Anyway, but I don't know if she's here, but anyway. Uh, all right. So now let's. So I'm going to start. I'm supposed to talk about my. You're supposed to talk about your own research and these types of things. So I'll start doing that. All right. So. Um, I'm not going to get uh, that into the um, so that's sort of one point about the inf the infancy stuff. Now we're moving on to preschool, all right? So now here, looking at spatial relational uh, concepts in preschool. Um, oh yeah, oh good, two legs, <laughs> right? So um, yeah, so you know, so we're looking uh, uh, right. So we're so. We're now uh, onto preschool and we're looking at these kind of weird spatial relational uh, things like symmetry in size versus monotonic change in size from left to right, right? And these are these novel uh, uh, relationships to uh, three-year-olds and four-year-olds, our assumption, right? And, we had, and, and they had a bunch of different trials to kind of learn a, across a series of examples of different animals all or different objects all in these shapes here, the, uh, Australian examples. Um, so, and what we sort of see is that at, you know, just to generalize now, to generalize the novel examples, um, to generalize the novel examples of the same relationships, three-year-olds are at chance, four-year-olds are above chance, they're significantly above chance, but not, but just kind of barely in terms of the actual number of, of accuracy, and five-year-olds are like really good at this, all right? Five-year-olds are substantial learning. Now, I think uh, uh, more important to the point is then what happens when you look at these cross-dimensional, these cross-dimensional transfer problems, where now it's the, the symmetry and the monotonicity is about the sort of darkness of the red as opposed to uh, in size, right? So we sort of shifted from size to um, color or hue, right? And then the five-year-olds are a bit above chance, but the four-year-olds are back to chance, uh, right? And so, and three-year-olds are, of course, still a chance, right? Now, the th now what? The, now, there's a bunch of other things I'm about these experiments I'm glossing over because they don't matter for now. But the point um, is, is that right? These four-year-olds, right? The, the ability to kind of generalize the new examples of the same relationship 
is sort of an in, insufficient or is not necessarily mean, you then have abstracted it to the point where you can then transfer it across these into these novel uh, perceptual dimensions or your kind of skilled recognition of it doesn't necessarily transfer. And now I'm gonna show you that same type of pattern, but with uh, university students, our typical uh, subjects where we have um, university students do, you know, so they're learning uh, 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 this sort of monotonic uh, change. So, so if you look at these stimuli, they going from left to right, uh, they either increase in size or decrease and change in size monotonically, or they don't change in size monotonically. And those are the two categories. However, also there's a sort of, that's confounded with the majority of red and uh, green versus the majority blue and yellow. And so during learning, you can, you can sort of focus on both of these things. You can learn, um, uh, you know, you can learn one, one or the other, or then we're gonna see what happens. So these are totally confounding during learning and we'll see what they do. Cause then during test, Right, so they're just learning to classify these things with feedback. Then during test, there's just more examples of the same type of thing. There are feature examples which have line long line lengths of each will equal length, and so you can only solve that if you've learned the features. And relation examples where now the color distributions are equal, so you can only learn that if you if you only can be good at that if you've learned the relations. And the cross mapped examples where. Um, you uh, where the now the relations and the features have swapped, where the relations from one category are now exist as now has the features of the other category. All right, so there's a lot of graphs in this next. Oh yeah, sorry. And then we have this far transfer, where now again the monotonic and the non-monotonic is going to these uh, changes in grayscale rather than line length. All right, so there's a lot of um, graphs here. All I'm going to sort of point out <laughs> is that the um, oh yeah, and also the, I should mention that these far transfer actually had feedback during it because at first it seemed like it was too, too tough or not feedback. I want to say there's a bunch of things that happen that push people around. So so I'm not going to go into what these things were, but a bunch of things happen that push people around on the feature, uh, um, the feature learning and the relation learning, but it doesn't necessarily help. For far transfer ness at all um they can sort of we can be pushed around they can learn new things about the relations learn new things about the features and the far transfer stuff may not uh correspond at all with how well they learn the relations uh ver correspond very much with like what helped them learn the relations originally now this is so with this so there, i'll get to the far transfer stuff shortly but here we have a ton so here we have uh the bit, uh, uh, so here are, are all the, um, here's across five exper four experiments, all the different people and how well they learn the relations and the features, all right? Now, these are the people who are above chance in both the relations and the features, right? So these people are above chance in both learning relations and learning features. And, and this is in a way is like Karen's uh, paper on the kids having both the feature-based hypotheses and the um, relational hypotheses in mind at the same time. However, I will sort of point to this gap here where even though you can become above chance at both, no one approached ceiling at both, right? So the ability, sort of the practice it needs to get sort of good at recognizing these relations, right? Is um, uh, uh, you know, is hurt if you pretend if you are also learning about these other things. So even if you're learning about these two things in parallel, they are still ultimately in competition with each other in terms of overall attentional demands. Preventing, you know, I imagine if we gave them, you know, weeks of training or something, they could eventually do it. But but given that uh, uh, there's no instruction to focus on one thing or the other, and they just are sort of learning it uh, uh, just on their own, that type of ceiling performance in each never occurs. You basically never, if you get ceiling in one, you, you know, never really get above 75% in the other accuracy. So the next bit um, where we, the way that we actually then found to really improve um, far transfer to different dimensions is with inference learning. So in classification learning, you show an entire um, 
uh, exemplar, and then you, um, you know, and then you ask what category is it, right? In inference learning, you give the category label and you show an incomplete exemplar, and you ask which of these sort of, you know, how how can you complete the exemplar such that it is a member of that category, All right? And here and in this again. Uh, the, the color distributions and the line lengths are both confounded in how you were to complete uh, the exemplar. Now this uh, shows superior far transfer. And this original study was still with feed, feedback during um, the far transfer phase, which is why everyone's above chance. Um, but here you're getting much better far transfer with this inference learning. All right, so the point, this next sort of point, this new, these new data are, we were looking at the, the role of symbolic representations could have in promoting, uh, uh, in uh, helping, you know, far transfer across new perceptual dimensions. All right. So instead of having weird, mon you know, these weird novel shapes, we just have numbers that either are monotonically changing in quantity across the screen or not, right? And then we manipulated whether or not that test in cl of classification came before the, the weird dots, far transfer trials, or after, seeing whether or not, and, that, and now we're having it with no feedback during uh, transfer, all right? So wh whether it came first or whether it came second, and how having the symbolic representations might assist in this, uh, um, you know, translation across perceptual dimensions. Right, and so, so, so we replicated the uh, basic finding, the, the finding from before, uh, where inference learning helps uh, um, relational learning compared to uh, classification, which classification doesn't does overall supports people to learn about the features. And so here, when this is now this is now during the dots, right? And what you're seeing here is that there are two main effects. The, if you inference is better than classification in terms of far transfer, but getting the digits first is better than getting the dots that than having the dots first, right? So getting so the only people who never really get it because throughout the far transfer are the people who who, who are doing the dots before the digits and they're do, and they learned on classification. But if you did inference and or you've gotten uh, uh, the digits first, then this far transfer you are well above uh, chance performance. And just to go the other way, the dots don't, doesn't help, does not help with the digits necessarily, right? So um, in the same uh, way. Uh, right, so the, you know, this is the digit transfer itself and on the digit transfer, the, so it's certainly easier, right? The digit transfer is certainly easier, but because, you know, there aren't competing features, there's just the quantities, but it's still not, the, the, these relationships are still not obvious, especially to the people, you know, and basically if you were at chance of classification over the course of this, you can, you can start to get it. Um, but that helps you sort of, but that's still sort of not, it's still not necessarily, it still takes uh, several trials for people, even who had almost no, um, uh, who were at chance uh, previously. All right, so what's the point of up to here? So the relational recognition skills show this kind of gradient of performance. Accurate recognition of a relation and new exemplars does not mean you built a representation that can be further applied to do across different perceptual dimensions, All right? And symbolic representations support generalization across perceptual dimensions. I'm going back and forth between things that's like really important or maybe obvious because what would symbolic representations be for if not helping you uh, transfer across different perceptual uh, dimensions, right? So, um, but also, you know, in addition, besides their communicative function. All right, but the point is, is that when you've abstracted, I believe, remembering correctly now from uh, previous talks where there was this notion of once you kind of get the relationship, you get it. Right, and that was sort of that was sort of the idea of sort of arguing against is that these are like these insight problems that once you kind of get it, you get it. Now I haven't gone back and totally replotted all the learning curves, but they don't show that type of um, insight. They do show much more gradual refinement of percept of relational 
perceptual skill. You know, similar to how you might get better at bird watching with practice, except that's all, you know, object features, all right? Um, all right, so how about, okay, so that's all just, maybe that's just these really weird perceptual relations, these weird spatial perceptual relations. And when, when you're having more conceptual uh, things, uh, conceptual relationships, it doesn't uh, do the same thing, okay? So now this next, um, I'm going to uh, refer to, so one of the things really interesting work from Rob uh, Goldstone and colleagues, um, where he was sort of showing that uh, when people are learning about the uh, self-organization principles of complex systems, that the, in a con when you had concrete situation, when you had a concrete versus a more idealized um, representation of the complex systems, people were much better at reasoning about the complex systems in the concrete case, but then, but the idealized case, even though they were initially worse, even though they were worse at reasoning with the idealized case, they were better at transferring to the other, uh, to, to a novel simulation that shows the same complex systems principles, right? So here um, you have this sort of weird negative correlation between initial learning and later transfer. All right, um, and so I think so. That's it all. So that's a further sort of example that the represent you know. So you can understand, you can appear to sort of understand a very abstract relation, right? The complex systems causality concepts are quite abstract principles, but you can appear to sort of understand them when supported with all these kinds of superficial features. But um, that doesn't necessarily that actually seems to be hindering in some cases uh, the transfer. All right. And I, I still think this is a pretty underappreciated point. The number of times I've talked to people in educational technology about how if you create something that they're really good at, that may actually mean they're getting worse at transfer. Anyway, that tends to fall, you know, people don't tend to respond to that very well. <laughs> if they did, I'd have a lot more grant funding. All right, so, um, right. So then, um, all right, so now I'm gonna talk about in, in this other case, uh, for my paper 2015, I'm just going to highlight the key part of this. So here people are learning about uh, causal systems like positive feedback systems and common, these other causal systems from short descriptions of phenomena like an audio and, and feed, you know, an, an, uh, audio feedback is when this microphone is really close to the amplifier and there's a feedback loop and there's a loop of amplification from there. So they have these little descriptions and we, they learn with a couple domains, engineering and history, and then they're giving a sorting task where they can either sort based on the domain like biology or economics, or they can sort by the causal system. All right. Now we also had them, so part of their training was both, we completely spelled out the, the structure for them. We had them draw diagrams, and then we had them align pairs of examples. And one of the things that the diagramming did was us to get a sort of measure of, did they get what the description of the structure was? Okay. Now, did they get the description of the structure? Now here, uh, I showed you most of the time they did, right? So there are eight diagrams and overall they were pretty good. And when we gave them at completely, when we completely described, um, and when we completely uh, uh, described it for them, it improved them, which makes sense. Right, and here's an example of of some of a feed, the feedback loop of a pre World War pre World War One arms race, and and the bat the incorrect one here didn't link the UK back to Germany, right? So they just represented a causal chain. All right, so the the important part of this for our current discussion is that well, one yes, the people who had who were perfect in their so good diagrammers here are eight out of eight, so people who were eight out of eight in their diagrams certainly had did sorted more um, descriptions of those phenomena by causal structure than the people who had less than, you know, eight out of eight, perfect. But the people who aligned on top of that, that still significantly increased their um, causal story. So, so the people who had, if you didn't do alignment and you just had perfect causal model diagrams, you still were under 50% causal sorts. Right, you didn't get over, you know, sixty percent causal sorts until you also do this extra alignment. All right, so the idea is that you can 
you can sort of have what appears to be pretty good causal models of all these exemplars um, and not necessarily generalize and not necessarily be able to recognize when you read a new, right? So you're just reading the, the, this text description of this new phenomenon, this new domain. And can you construct the causal representation from that text? Or is it robust enough to make it the reason for your sorting? All right. And all of these, and this also works for people who said, how are you trying to sort? And people said, oh, I'm trying to sort by causal system. So their attempt to sort by causal system, they're being able to diagram each uh, example sort of well, doesn't that still on top of that, the abstraction can be sort of supported further. And I think that's, and that's a bit different than some of the other comparison work that I, that I think, like for example, Jeff has done a lot of where a lot of what you end up looking at is, you know, you read these two examples and you kind of describe the schema. And if you describe the schema, that's the predictor of transfer. You know, it's, it's of course the methods are different, but if the diagram is a sort of uh, measure of that, saying just as even describe, just having some representation of the, of the relation is not necessarily enough to transfer. You can sort of go further in the abstraction. All right, so that was, um, so to give it more now, okay, so that is abstracting from language and the transfer task is more length, right? So you're, you're abstracting from descriptions of text and the transfer task is more description, like more text descriptions, right? So now here's a task. So sort of let this work led by Franzi uh, Kessler, um, where we're using these items. So these microdin items, if people haven't seen them, they are, you, they're they're sort of comp. They're sort of do they are to assess complex problem solving abilities, right? So these are used in the PISA international uh, assessment. And the basic idea is that they have these novel causal systems. You have a bunch of variables that you can increase and decrease. And then there's a bunch of output variables that have some, you have input variables that you can go increase this input variable, decrease this other input variable, and you can see what happens to the output variables. And the, and the basic job is to, through, through a series of explorations and trials is figuring out what the, um, what the different, uh, uh, you know, what is the causal structure among these input variables. And they all have a cover story like this one is people, this one's training a handball team. Here I can show you the video. Here you see people, all right, they're hitting up, you know, they're, oh, let's increase training A. What's that? Oh, it's helping their motivation. Oh, this one's helping the power of their throw. Oh, let's training C. This one is making them more exhausted, right? And then at the end, you say, what were, oh, whoops, let me pause, uh, ad has come up, so you can't see. <laughs> Here you go, right. So you can see that you sort of draw the causal relationships that you think uh, have been um, underlying that system, connecting the inputs to the outputs. All right. Now, also, in addition to um, these direct comments, there are these kind of feedback loop type things, these eigendynamics, where things can increase on their own or their outputs can affect each other. All right. Now, what uh, this was a poster presented at CogSci, if anyone uh, saw Franzi's poster, what, what would happen was is um, basic that, and if when they, so he started off with the same training that we did in the 2015 uh, paper where they're, where they're training on these, on these text examples. And then we're showing that the people who, and then they're given that sorting task. And basically the sorting, being able to sort by causal system was highly predictive of then properly determining the right causal relationships in this uh, complex problem solving task, right? And so again, you know, so all the possibilities are still there, right? There's only so many causal relationships that exist, but still having these sort of abstract notions of these different types of causal systems increase their ability to actually identify what the causal systems were in this exploration task. Um, now, uh, th there was a, um, there, there were some people who were already so good at causal sorting in the control condition that there isn't a, there isn't a, just an effect of the training that doesn't isn't mediated via the sensitivity to causal structures. But basically, you could if if you're really good at the causal sorting, either because you already are for some reason, because these were engineering students, or because you you learned it via our training, you then were really good at discovering and applying the causal systems in the exploration task. But there was this transfer from across these uh, uh, no types of tasks. Right, so again, that's the sort of this notion is 
having, if you were just building up causal representation, if, if every given example, you were building up an a sort of abstract schema along with all of your exemplar learning, it's not as clear why you necessarily would get these types of transfer benefits. Right, so now I'm gonna talk about a case where these abstract causal systems seem to help you do belief revision. Now, we all are aware in general that there are such things as sports, so there are such things as spurious correlations that exist and that you have, you should, after you learn, and sometimes there's a common cause that causes both the things that were correlated with each other, right? And I've talked about this example before, so um, people have heard it potentially, but if the parent, so there was this paper published in Nature that parents giving their kids nightlights were causing them to have to be nearsighted later in life, right? Here's a uh, article on CNN Health, right? And the thing, however, the part of this that they didn't realize was that the parents had the thing, the parents having myopia themselves was leading to them giving the nightlight, more likely to give the nightlight to the child, right? And that also was then more likely for their child to have nearsightedness because of a genetic inheritance. Right, so there isn't actually a direct causal connection. But what happens when people are in this situation where they first learn about a correlation and then learn about a, a cause that re-explains that correlation, right? So perfect belief revision will be getting rid of that, um, that causal connection from your, from your mental model, but causal imprinting is when it stays, even if you add, um, the, the myopia, even if you realize the parent having myopia causes these two things, you still hold on to that direct causal link. And the way, um, and the Taylor on did this with these made up uh, viruses and conditions. And initially people learn about how the Berlosis condition might correlate with the Capri condition. And then also learn about how this virus might cause both. Or so there's look, so this is an observation or learning trial. And I'm not gonna go into the, how the, the stats of it worked, but basically if you, and so the, the basic finding is if you learn about all three variables from the beginning, you only care about, you end up saying, yes, the, the virus A causes B and C and B does not cause C directly. But their finding is if you have BC first and then learn ABC, you, you still hold on to that B to C causal link, right? Even though if you had a different sequence, um, you wouldn't have uh, uh, you know, held on to that idea. This is a side note. I've now looked at this in the pandemic where uh, if, you if you start out as a, as a surface transmitter person, right, as we all kind of were, and then you wanna shift to an aerosol model of transmission, everyone still believes in the surface model, even though there's no evidence for it. Anyway, so um, so happy to talk about that some other time. Uh, but here, um, you, know, you have this BC block, that, then you have this ABC block, and then, right, so people end up in, people end up, end up with is this model where they sort of think oh, everything's causing everything in this ABC, and you know what I mean, uh, uh, when you have the BC first, okay? Now, um, there's a bunch of different conditions in this, just to sort of summarize the important thing is that when people, so, so if you look at the uh, ABC altogether and the BC first, this is the ratings of A to C, A to B, and A to B to C, the important thing is you know how strong is this b to c link right so this b to c link is the one that's like wrong right and when you're in abc all together they recognize it's a to b and a to c is stronger than the b to c however if you have bc first and then you learn about all three variables you do you infer an equal causal strength across the three possibilities however if you have uh, uh our same training about notion of um you know the abstract notion of common cause systems now in here we didn't even do like in common causes can we explain correlations which probably would have made this more effective but we just sort of uh we just sort of included the same training from before along with other causal systems right because we didn't want to say hey we didn't want to teach them one causal system we still taught them the, the the array of causal systems however the common cause system being available made it more likely to recognize oh actually this isn't you know, B to C isn't actually as causal. I can change my mind and realize that A to B and A to C 
are the real causes because perhaps this is an example of a common cause, cause system, right? So the categorization of the whole observational learning thing as a common cause helps to revise the belief in a way that just more and more trials doesn't do. You can just give them more and more trials and they never really revise this B to C belief, but having this common cause concepts helps you revise uh, uh, your belief. All right. So um, in both perceptual simulations and linguistic uh, descriptions, um, accuracy, uh, so, so accurately understanding the causal relations in a learning example may not be sufficient to transfer the understanding to a novel example. Supporting abstract representations or generalizable recognition skills, maybe that's a better way to think of it than more abstract, helps discover causal structures and active exploration tasks and revise beliefs about spurious correlations. These patterns seem, to me seem incompatible between exemplar learning and abstraction learning as a sort of single parallel uh, uh, process. All right, um, back to this point, uh, anyway, maybe it doesn't, so, but the idea is sort of like, if you sort of, let's say have a hypothesis, let's even say you have a kind of hypothesis structure in your thinking, like common cause structures, because there was sort of a possibility of how these things can relate to one another, right? And it certainly does seem like they can do that because in the ABC all at once context, they basically do infer a common cause structure, right? But that doesn't mean it's available as an explicit object of reasoning to help you revise your beliefs is the idea. So even if it's kind of there in their behavior in some way, it doesn't mean it, it can be used for reflection. And I thought this was similar to Annette Kamala Smith's idea of sort of knowledge being in the system versus knowledge to the system that you can use as an explicit object of uh, reflection. Right, hopefully that isn't too long a, a bow. Um, I guess, in, so in my remain, uh, uh, maybe I should, uh, 45 in. Um, well, I'll try to just very quickly show you some patterns of, okay, so I was doing all this kind of not looking at what it looks like to have real expertise, right? So, so far I was looking at either infants or uh, preschool children or university students learning new stuff, right? But now also let's look at what happens when people actually know things and have known them for a long time, right? So for example, people with geoscience PhDs. And so if we sort of ask people, to finish this analogy, a balloon floating is like blank because blank, catching a cold is like blank because blank. Now here are these, they, they wanna fill that out. A balloon floating is caused by Archimedes principle about density differences and, and density differences are incredibly important in geoscience uh, because it's like underlies plate tectonics and all this other stuff um, that geoscientists understand, right? Um, catching a cold, is caused by a virus, right? We all sort of are, so a balloon floating and catching cold are all things that we're probably aware of the explanations for. Um, and maybe this, and maybe the viral one has, uh, uh, has changed since we collected these data, but we still necessarily think about if we're not in geoscience, let's say, or you're not a doctor in the second case, let's say, you don't necessarily think about these causes too much. And so they may not be particularly prominent when you're just asked to sort of complete this analogy. Right, and so we had two conditions. We were asked, hey, complete this analogy. And then another condition said, hey, think about the cause of what causes these things when you complete this analogy, right? And just to sort of clear, clearly show, the thing I wanna point out is that, so the prompted, right? The dark black is the prompted. And, the, and, and when, we, when we didn't say anything like, hey, just fill out this analogy, that's the, that's the lighter gray. And basically the only people who ever do causal analogies unprompt, uh, uh, open-ended, unprompted, are the geoscience experts about the balloon one specifically, right? So no one does it, only, you know, every, you know, so no one really uh, uh, does it when um, you're talking about the cold because none of, they're not doctors. They all make analogies like, oh, it's kind of like being drunk because you feel bad or, or, or hang I mean, hungover or whatever. You feel bad or, you know, things like that. So, or, you know, or they're like, you know, they're not really talking about the actual cause of what's happening. Um, now, also, this is compared to intermediate, these are sort of grad students in geoscience. And we also have people with PhDs in vision science and, um, or just sort of people on Mechanical Turk. And if you had a PhD in vision science and you were prompted to use the cause, everyone goes, oh, I get it. I know what causes balloons floating, uh, but you didn't do it unprompted, right? And so the idea is that if you, are using the concepts of your domain of expertise 
you don't, you just sort of use them all the time, right? When you're an expert, you, you know, you just walk around thinking everything is like this, <laughs> right? Or you're just sort of ready to use it whenever it's applicable, right? Not necessarily that everything, but you recognize when it's applicable uh, immediately, all right? Um, oh, whoops, now it's not, uh-oh, my slides are no longer advancing. Hold on. Um, right, so as a final uh, uh, example, there's really a great paper on flank Lloyd Wright, uh, where, so this is, this house falling water, which is sort of seen as masterpiece. And people sort of thought of it as um, this kind of out of the nowhere, out of nowhere, brilliant design. But one of the things that this paper uh, shows was basically how he made a bunch of different structures that had all of the sort of elements before. He just had to adapt them to this new environment that it was he was in, right? And the, and the sort of idea was that not that his, his genius of this creation, Frank Lloyd Wright's creation, wasn't a stroke of magical light bulb insight. It was the adaptation of years of creative practice where he had built up with what they call the vocabulary of elements, where you have all these different concepts, all these different sort of concepts that you can recombine together. So, that, so the point of this, um, uh, compared to the last one, is I just sort of focused on a scientist with a single concept, right? But obviously experts no, don't, don't just have one concept that they use a lot, that they have, they develop a, uh, you know, a whole sort of uh, lexicon or vocabulary of all these sort of concepts that they adapt to these new situations. And I just want to give a shout out to Ji Song's uh, work on statistics uh, education that sort of embodies, I think, what I'm, you know, embodies this kind of notion of how of, uh, of relational concepts as a sort of set of uh, skills that you have to sort of practice recognizing uh, across varied examples, but in a way that you're constantly connect. And the thing that's really interesting about her book is how she constantly connects these things back to the overall our, our higher level concept of a general linear model. And every example of statistics that we teach undergrads are just another example of the general linear model. And I think it's, uh, uh, really cool that basically the constant practicing of these connections, practicing uh, uh, and comparing and building up that sort of relational knowledge is what actually produces uh, deep understanding and transferable uh, knowledge. All right, sorry. So summary, now I'm concluding. So the summary of all this, hopefully that wasn't too long a bone, people can see the connection here, where from infancy through adult expertise development, constructing, then refining, and adapting representations is cognitive work, and that learning and the use of individual or sets of related relational concepts, um, right, and this and also the type of things that Jeff uh, talks about, uh, right, is not unlike a sort of skill acquisition. Um, this recent paper by Sam Gershman, one of his 500 in the last, in the last year, uh, tries to kind of formalize um, this sort of general approach for precision and rep or for representation building. I, I'm not saying his formal approach is, I'm endorsing it, but it's basically this idea that, I think the overarching idea of this paper is that when, you know, that you have to make choices about the representations that you put the effort into refining. And there's some kind of, you know, when we care about something, we build more precise representations, or when you practice something, you build more precise representations, but there's sort of a global thing, it's not necessarily specific to relations, relations or anything, it's just generally representational precision is, this kind of effortful thing that we have limited capacity uh, to do, all right? In that um, initial representation uh, formation can be fragile, for example, you know, in infancy, but also when, if you're a student learning a new stats example, right, new stats principle, right? And representations also can become more abstract and flexible over a lifetime. Uh, so I, yeah, I think the infants and Frank Lloyd Wright doing the same thing kind of, <laughs> right? So not, yeah, anyway, not exactly, right? So, uh, all right, so now to the, to the initial um, inspiration that I started with, uh, this is, the rap this now I'm just getting into prompting discussion because I want to hear everyone else's thought on uh, all of it at, 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 um, and here as well, right? So for those of you who are sticking around, 
Um, so certainly it's not all concepts at once. Um, uh, uh, right, so, so Frank sort of, the question was, does, do all concepts go from concrete? Do we sort of in general go from concrete to abstract? And, cer and certainly not all concepts at once, but um, any individual concept, let's say, does the increased skilled rapid recognition of relational con concepts across more contexts that can also be flexibly combined and adapted to a greater experience. Does that mean it's getting more abstract or is that not what people mean by that? And then um, the, the final thing, particularly leading back to this hierarchical Bayesian approach that builds representations at many levels of abstraction simultaneously, um, where there's limitations of representational refinement. So, so even if you initially can get the hypotheses multiple levels, there seems to be limitations on refinement and further elaboration of those representations at multiple levels at once, and also explicitly reifying causal systems at the category level seems to help a bunch of different stuff, sorting, exploration, and belief revision. And the final, final point <laughs> uh, is that I think, or, or other, so I, but I think um, there's a sort of incompatibility potentially. So where are these things in, incompatible? I think if you look at the at progressive alignment specifically, where close comparisons are better for relation learning than farther comparisons. If you have multiple hypotheses, let's say you have a, a relational hypothesis and a object-based hypothesis, right? Close comparisons, in a certain sense, reinforce the object-based hypothesis, right? Because you're, sh you're showing that th it really is only constrained to these few objects. And yet it seems to shift you to be able to do further, shifts you away from that to shift to further generalization. So I think if the close, so I think the, um, the, that, that, that some of the patterns and the specifics, I think in this show a different process, even if our competencies are such that we can have these hypotheses of multiple levels of abstraction, I think some of the patterns of the specifics don't do that. Anyway, sorry, I think, I know this is a 90 minute session, but I'm sure everyone is ready for me to stop talking about this. So, all right, uh, well, thanks everybody, um, especially Karen and that Twitter thread. Um, to inspiration and all the people help uh, uh, collect uh, the data um, and collaborate on that stuff.